Now, this is a very, very big deal. And, and the reason for this is because uh, if you, is it sleep disturbances, if they go unaddressed, uh, are, are very significant in either exacerbating psychiatric symptoms across all diagnostic categories or resulting in less than adequate response to medications. And unfortunately, some psychiatric medications cause sleep disturbances. So we really need to be attuned to this. Now, of course, we know about the insomnia of depression and anxiety. I'm not going to talk about this. One comment, though, is hypersomnia seen in depression. It's in about 15 to maybe 20 percent of people with major depression. Uh, they have atypical depressive symptoms, and the cardinal feature is hypersomnia, sleeping a lot, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, despite that experiencing a significant amount of daytime fatigue. Now, we, we will talk uh, uh, about treating atypical depression a little bit later, but let me just say right now, a very important uh, caveat. There's two studies, one done in the United States and one done in Italy. They've shown very conclusively when people present with major depression but they have hypersomnia, it turns out that three-fourths of these people have bipolar two. Okay? So when you get hypersomnia as a part of the presenting picture, that these people really and truly, I think, should be considered bipolar until proven otherwise. Now, we've got to keep in mind some of them I uh, don't have bipolar. In fact, uh, many people who have seasonal affective disorder have hypersomnia. And some of these people have bipolar, but most of them don't, okay? But still, uh, we need to keep a, a real high index of suspicion about possible bipolar. And usually it's bipolar 2. And we'll talk more about bipolar 2 a little bit later on. Let's look briefly at uh, the changes in sleep architecture seen during depression and anxiety and then look at ways to facilitate sleep and also the drugs that can absolutely demolish it. If you take a look at sleep architecture, and, and I'll do this very briefly uh, just as a point of review because most of us have had this before uh, in graduate school, is during the night there are different stages of sleep. There's rapid eye movement sleep indicated by the dark uh, horizontal bars up here. You get most of that in the second half of the night. And then there's uh, non-REM sleep, uh, which is stages one, two, three, and four. And you get uh, most of that, about two-thirds of that, you get uh, during the first half of the night. And what, what's uh, different about this is that in, in non-REM sleep is you get slow-wave sleep. Slow-wave sleep has also uh, been referred to as deep sleep uh, or restorative sleep. Now, you get just tiny amounts of that in stages one and two. Stage one is kind of half awake, half asleep. All right, but you really get it in stages three and four. Now, slow wave, all kinds of sleep are important, okay? Uh, but slow wave sleep is especially critical for, for maintaining good functioning, uh, restorative or deep sleep. Uh, one is if you're absent, adequate amounts of slow wave sleep, there's clear evidence that it compromises the immune system. Uh, in, in particular, it reduces, uh, significantly reduces the number of natural killer cells that are out kind of uh, roaming through the body on the lookout for invading organisms. Uh, during slow wave sleep is where you release most human growth hormone. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, the relevance of this, we'll talk more about later, but human growth hormone is essential in, in adulthood for maintaining and rebuilding the skeletal system. And so if you have less uh, amounts of human growth hormone, it significantly increases the risks of osteoporosis. We'll come back to this a little bit later today. Uh, and if, if you chronically miss uh, slow wave sleep or don't get enough, then almost across the board, uh, people get this fatigue, cognitive problems, mainly being able to kind of stay focused and pay attention, and affect regulation problems. People become more sensitive. They take things personally. Their, their emotional controls are not as good. So let's take a look at what happens uh, at, just as a result of anxiety and depression in terms of sleep architecture. Okay, the first thing is with anxiety it is uh, in, in uh, pr you know, prehistoric times, you say we have some primitive uh, uh, early humans out in equatorial Africa, and life is going okay, and, but in the last couple of days they've been hearing lions kind of roaring during the day and during the night. They're getting a little bit nervous, you know, because they know about this. So they're the release of certain stress hormones, and we'll talk about several of these, but one of them is cortisol, which is released during high stress, and it really practically abolishes slow-wave sleep. So our, our uh, frightened, worried uh, early hominids now are not getting very much slow-wave sleep because they're scared about these lines. That's a good thing. 
Because if they're sleeping at night and the lions come around for a midnight snack, they don't want to be in deep sleep. You know, they, want, they need to be aroused real easily so they can get up and run away or fight or something. Three days later, the lions move away. Ah, you know, they're gone. And now they go back into slow wave sleep. So fundamentally, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. It's adaptive. But unfortunately, chronic anxiety has the result of reducing the amount of time spent in slow wave sleep. <coughs> Excuse me. With depression, there are all kinds of changes, but the main thing about depression is the release of uh, the, the, the stress hormone cortisol. We'll talk a lot more about this after, uh, a little bit later today. Uh, typically cortisol, this uh, uh, stress hormone, is really at a level of zero during the night, uh, which is good because it, it just runs sleep. Uh, early in the morning, about an hour or two before you wake up, normally uh, the body starts producing cortisol and it actually is a part of what helps us wake up and, uh, and, and, you know, my, uh, I'll start waking up actually in about three hours from now. I just flew in from the West Coast. I, my cortisol is still West Coast time. <laughs> if, I, if I yawn during my talk, you'll know why. And, and then it gets high during the morning and drops off and goes back down to zero at night. But people who have uh, depression have high cortisol. It can be high or it can be t into toxic ranges, which we'll talk about later on. But a major impact of this then is to significantly uh, reduce the amount of time spent in slow wave sleep. So kind of the take home message here is these disorders in and of themselves because of hormonal changes can really change sleep architecture